and everyone here on Zoom. Uh, can you give us a thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> That's good. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is our first uh, independently hosted uh, seminar of the year. We hosted one earlier joint with SciSoc, and it's our first in-person uh, seminar since the start of the pandemic. So uh, the committee has no idea what we're doing, uh, but we hope you enjoy it. And we have an excellent speaker for you today. Uh, and I have, I'm, I'm sure he does not need any introduction, um, but I prepared a brief one for him anyway. Uh, so our lecturer today is Professor Ian Hodder. He'll be lecturing on the forces and flows of things. And he is the uh, family professor uh, emeritus at Stanford uh, University. And indeed, not only are we welcoming, welcoming him, but we're actually welcoming him back to Cambridge. Uh, so he studied at Peterhouse for his PhD from 1971 uh, until 1975 uh, when he was awarded his PhD. He lectured in archaeology at, uh, here at Cambridge from 1977 until 1999 and was a fellow at Darwin College from 1990 to 2001. In 1990, he also co-founded the, uh, the Cambridge Archaeological Unit uh, with Chris Evans. And in 1996, he was appointed uh, professor in archaeology, um, which he served as uh, until leaving to Stanford in 1999. Uh, he's especially known for his work in archaeological theory and his excavations at Chattelboya, where he is in Turkey, where he has been excavating since 1993. Uh, he is author of the book Symbols in Action, uh, as well as Reading the Past and the Archaeological Pro uh, Process, uh, Chattelboya, The Leopard's Tale, among many others. Uh, in 1996, he was um, elected a fellow of the British Academy, and in 2009 won the Huxley Memorial Medal uh, from the Royal Anthropological Institute. Uh, so with that, let us welcome back Professor Ian Hunt. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to the society. Um, and thank you particularly uh, for arranging it to happen in a fast lecture room, because I have very many happy memories of uh, teaching here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, and the many sort of lively, aggressive, interesting, uh, disappointing debates. Uh, took place here, so it's wonderful to be to be back. So thank you for uh, uh, arranging that. Although it actually looks entirely different, and, and if you hadn't told me it's that lecture, I, I wouldn't have known. The, the, the entrances are in the wrong place, and it just all looks completely different. Uh, and that, that's a part of the, I'm afraid it's part of the theme of my talk, uh, which, which is about whether things that uh, we think of the same really are the same. Is, is this really the fab lecture room still, or is it, or is it something else? Uh, has it changed so much that it's no longer the same thing? And certainly, my feeling coming here and talking to you today is that it just feels completely different. It's just another uh, another place, not not the same place at all. So, so that lead, leads me to. Um, what I'm afraid is going to be a, a very theoretical uh, talk. Uh, and um, although I, I don't like the idea of trying to be a sort of philosopher in some way, um, I, um, it's not moving forward for me for some reason. Um, but I do want to start with this sort of a philosophical conundrum uh, that I believe uh, Heraclitus struggled with in various other ancient Greek philosophers. 
It's about Theseus's ship. And so we're talking about the ship rather than the Saponicta room. And uh, the, the ship, um, uh, so you imagine a wooden ship with sails and so on. And uh, gradually over the years, uh, Theseus's ship ran out of this or that. And the planks had to be gradually replaced, and the, 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 the ropes and sails had to be gradually replaced as they sort of wore out and whatever. And so by the end of it, there was nothing on the ship that was uh, originally there. So, so the question, the, the puzzle is, is, is it still Theseus's ship, or has it, has it become something else? And um, the uh, you know, as I said, philosophers over the centuries have struggled, struggled with this and come up with different sorts of ways of making sense of it and interpreting it and so on and so forth. Um, and there are lots of variations on, on the same sort of theme. So, for example, if you can imagine taking all the bits out of it gradually and then putting them all somewhere and then putting them all back together, would that be Theseus's shape? Or is that some sort of deep fake? In some way, what, what what has happened there? Which, which is the real which is the real thesis of Shiv? Anyway, so so it's a it's a question really about how something can have an identity, but the beat can it could also be a flow that is gradually changing. And and uh, and, and I, I I find myself fascinated by this. So when I'm walk, driving along a freeway. And you look at the car in, in front of you and you sort of think, well, yeah, that's that is that the same car all the time? Is it, is it the same same thing, or is it or is it just uh, keep changing to lots of different cars as every every second? Is it is it a different car? And, and of course, it, it is using up uh, wear on the on the on the wheels. And you look in, in detail, it's changing, and of course the the, the petrol. Is, is running out and the water is running out and the oil is running out and, it, and everything is sort of changing in it. So is, is it really the same car all the time or is it lots and lots of different cars stacked up in a, in a long line? And when I'm, I teach a class on, on a, whole, a whole seminar class on, on this in, where I now teach in Istanbul. So we sit around a table and you sort of hit the table and you think, Surely that's all the same table. It's stable. It's not a flow. It's really something that's solid. A table. But then, you, well, the more you think about it, you realise it's, it's it's more complicated than that. Because it, 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 do you know what Craigslist is? Is that something that you have you have in England now? Anyway, it's a sort of buying and selling thing where you you, you can get rid of stuff and, and 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 you sort of bid for things. So so what the, the value of this thing is changing. All the time, or something like Craigslist, or, or on the stock market. If I wanted to set sell this, I mean, yeah, the value is always changing, and uh, as, as it ages, the value changes. So, so you could say, well, but the table is still the same, but the properties change. But I, 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 I have trouble with that. I don't really see how you can have separate properties from the thing itself. So anyway, I, I, I am. Um, uh, absorbed by this this issue of whether whether something is always um, the same or, or or what creates the identity? What is what is the thing? If everything is changing, what creates the identity? And is it actually better to start talking about flows of things rather than stable uh, entities? Um, and there, you know, and there's a huge amount of modern um, the last few decades, I suppose. Uh, theory in the social sciences uh, about these sorts of issues and uh, uh, about whether we should start talking more, more about becoming rather than being, the sort of emergence of things rather than entities in, uh, as having clear essences. So one of the main reason I, I got absorbed in this sort of problem uh, is um, the work that was mentioned earlier that I've been doing at Chateau Rio uh, in central Anatolia, which is a site that dates uh, from about 7,100 BC to 6,000 BC. And, I, and I'm not going to um, go into to it except to, to, to draw out one thing, which is 
uh, that the mound is um, about 21 meters high, so 60, 70 foot high, it's an enormous, big and high mound. And, and it's a high mound uh, because when people built their mud brick houses, uh, they, they then, at the end of their lives, they would fill in the house and build another house directly on top. And they just would do that over the time, living in a house, knocking down the upper part, filling in the lower part, and building another house on the walls of the previous house. And so you, you can see that um, here, and this is in a, in a cross section uh, through a part of Canterbury. And you can see these long sequences of walls here and over here. And so this is one house here. Or rather, I'm going to question whether it's one house. But anyway, just for the moment, here, here's one house here. And then another house is built on top, and another house on top, and another house on top, and so on. And this goes on for hundreds of years. Just So you end up with a huge big column with, of walls with floors in it that, that goes over and can go on for 500 years or, or so. And, and in, in detail, then, you've got, you've got these houses that are stacked on top of each other. But of course, you could argue that these are not three houses, but one house uh, that has been raised upward. And you could raise the floor, basically, um, by, by a meter and a half or so every time. So, we, we don't know what people at this time thought, but it's quite possible they saw this whole column as one house. And we have lots of evidence of continuities in the house, and you know, people doing the same thing from house to house. So there's a lot of continuity, but it suggests there's a sort of oneness to it. So you could say the whole thing is a house, rather than the way we, we've been looking at it, which is at least each of these individual um, layers, if you like, is, is a house. And we can go down to a more detailed uh, level, um, because this is a cross section through one of those uh, simple houses uh, that I started off talking about as a house. It's a cross section. So he, he, here are your walls on 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 the side, you don't have the wall here. Uh, and these are all the floors, multiple floors. And the, the walls, the floors and the walls were plastered sometimes uh, 450 times. So, so do we think these are sort of uh, perhaps monthly re, re or re, re plastering to the wall? And, and if you have a lot of patience as an archaeologist, you can reconstruct all these. You can work one by one in all these different layers. Here's the layers going over a, a bench, and then these are other layers in another part of the house. But in this part of the house, you have burials that occur from some of these floors, but not from others. And so, as, as, the, as these things are re-floored, perhaps on a, something like a monthly basis, different things happen in the house. You have burials in some places and not in others, and you have um, uh, ovens and hearths in, in other parts of the uh, uh, house that come and go and so on. So everything is moving all the time at this scale, the scale of uh, monthly changes. Um, but we can go uh, still further. And if we take each one of these floors here, and you look at, at, at it micromorphologically, what you find is, can you see this, that there are lots and lots of even finer lenses of plastering. So this is, these seem to be like monthly or several monthly renovations. And then these much finer layers. And we don't really know what sort of scale that is, but you know, maybe weeks or, or whatever. So very, very fine changes. And again, these changes, at a sort of micro scale, um, are associated with all sorts of changes in the in the house, move, moving things around and so on and so forth. Um, 
And then on any one of these floors, you, you see people doing things like um, sweeping away, sweeping away rubbish or um, uh, uh, replastering uh, the, the edge of the bin or something. So there's continual activity going on. So is each of these a new house? Or is each of those things up there a new house? So where, where what, what there, there seems to be a continual change, and at what point do you say, you know, this is one house and this is another house? And you can also do that spatially. I'm talking about temporarily. But it's also the case that spatially, we have lots of evidence that these houses were parts of groups of houses, and not not in any simple way, not not spatially necessarily, but uh, through um, marriage networks and. Um, uh, co burial networks and food sharing networks, all sorts of complex networks. And it may be that when you said a house, you didn't mean one of these buildings, you meant a whole group of houses which formed a house, like you know, the house of Windsor or something, you know, that, that sort of sense of house. So it all, it everything becomes very flux, fluxy and, and difficult to define. And when, when we and you, you begin to realize that when we say this is a house, what we're doing is we're imposing a stability, and imposing a fixity on something that is completely fluid and, and always changing. So where does one house end uh, and another begin? And what what are the and can we start talking about this thing, this, this sort of process in terms of, of, of waves of energy that are flowing through this system? And these energies are obviously things to do with uh, the desire for shelter or the will to power or status or something to do with ancestry, because there's lots of, as I said, burial in these houses, lots of focus on um, respecting ancestral remains. So, so you could say that what, what drives this whole process of um, this whole flow of houseness uh, is are these sorts of uh, desires, but also that there are material forces that hold the thing together through time. So, as well as the social processes, these these buildings are always um, falling down and falling apart. Uh, because the type of clay that is used, the metric clay, is very responsive to moisture, so it expands and contracts very easily. And so a huge amount of effort was put in by the inhabitants in order to keep these buildings up and to use uh, the stickiness of the clay, the weight of the bricks, and so on, in, in order to construct something that was stable and lasted for a long time. The, the use of wooden posts to try and hold the thing up. So in lots of ways, um, it was an attempt uh, to to use mechanical forces in, in order to sustain uh, the, the houseness flow, if you like. So we can think of a house as a stable thing produced by forces, or as a wave or pulse, a flow of force that produces things in its way. In this case, the house is like a pulse of energy that acts like a magnet increasingly drawing storage, production, art, ritual, and burial towards it. And what I mean by that is that during this time in the, in the Neolithic in the Middle East, uh, over the whole region really, there is a process by which more and more is brought into the house. Um, burials, certainly, but more and more evidence of production, more and more art and ritual is taken away from, you probably know these great ritual centers like Gobekli and so on, that become so famous. But all, all of that stuff was gradually, during the time of Chateauhuya, brought into the house. So it's like the, 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 the house acted as a sort of magnet that, that drew in other processes, other flows of, their, of various sorts. And this is where, again, I want to return to a more modern uh, philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, who very much used the ideas about electromagnetism in order to talk, to develop what is called a process philosophy which is um, having increasing impact in archaeology. There was a, an issue of world archaeology recently all about process archaeology in, in this Whiteheadian sense. 
And he said that an actual entity is a process and is not describable in terms of the morphology of a stuff. And I think this example that I've given you of the Chattel View House is a really good example of, um, of, of, of that. <clears throat> So I mentioned that I, I taught I, I taught at uh, Stanford, and one of the uh, things that um, uh, the founder of the university got involved with when the university was founded was he had a horse farm, and he was very interested in using uh, the latest uh, technologies in the late 19th century uh, in order to try and find out whether uh, there was a moment at which the horse was not touching the ground at all. It was, it was at some moment at which the horse was entirely in the air when it was galloping. And so he took the, they, they took these pictures of a horse, uh, horse being ridden. And in a way, what Whitehead is arguing is that we can talk about flows as if they are made up of these lots and lots of little people's actual entities, these lots and lots of little moments uh, where um, that move from move from A to B and take with them something of the past and they move into the future in some way. Um, and uh, it seems to me that this idea uh, is of interest in a number of ways because what it makes me think about is whether we should talk about those little layers of Chateau William in the same way as these horse images or whether we should talk about pots uh, in sequences of pops in the same way as these horse images. And the advantage of looking at looking at flows in this way is, is that you don't have to decide on where one thing begins and ends. Um, so I, I'm of the, of the firm view that nothing comes from nothing. So there is never anything that comes from nothing. Everything always comes from something else. And, and But in archaeology, we're always trying to cut off and say, this is where something begins. This is where agriculture begins. This is where the Bronze Age begins. This is where this bank ceramic pottery starts. We, you know, we, we have all this sort of notion that something begins and ends. So we're always trying to do that, even though uh, it, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible. And so one advantage of this is not having to decide on where one thing begins and another and, and ends. And it allows one to move from things, objects, matter to forces, pulses, waves, sequences, so that each pop or house is a pulse that moves the flow in a certain direction. The mimetic process, where each pop house takes the energy from one entity and passes it on to the next. So we tend to talk about pots popping each other, whereas a different view is that what pots do is they take some energy from another pot and they take it into themselves and take it on to them onto the next pot. And someone who has uh, tried to express this into the diagrammatic form is, uh, is Alfred Gell. Um, and uh, in his book, Art is an Agency, uh, he, he, he has a, a discussion of the Maori meeting house, which uh, as an object distributed in space and time. And what he's trying to show is uh, that if you have a series of dates along the top uh, axis, you can look at each Maori house as um, showing connection, some sort of flow uh, from uh, other earlier houses, and then moving on to a to a later a later house. And in, and, an, and another perhaps clearer example by, from Gel is uh, where he takes the work of Marcel Duchamp. That the oeuvre of Duchamp uh, and take each, in, each individual work of Duchamp and, and argues that each, each individual work uh, has both um, retention and protention. So that each, each individual work uh, looks backwards to some earlier work that he's done. But it also looks forward to, a, to another work when he's trying to develop, you know, in some particular way, looking for something, searching for something. He's moving forward, but always in a particular line. And it's always fascinating me about artists, my artists, 
um, that how he, they do seem to produce these errors, uh, these sorts of uh, flows of, of work that, that, that go in a certain seeking direction, but they, that you can see it's always their, their work. Um, uh, and um, so gel for that retention and uh, protension. And so what one's seeing here is that, that each individual work is, is like a pulse of energy that takes uh, energy from an, a previous uh, work and, and takes it on to, into the future. And of course, it, 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 this is just looking at Duchamp, but there was, it, it's possible to look, look back at Duchamp's influences and forward at the people who've been influenced by Duchamp. So at another level, the flow is, is one that, um, uh, at a larger scale, in, in incorporates and subsumes them in Duchamp. So, if we go back to the, the title of your power, um, the retention, you can talk about retention in a number of ways uh, as Bourdieu's type of habitus or history making or social learning. There are a number of ways in which you can explain why it is that people wanted to make houses similar to earlier houses. But there are also material constraints and entanglements. Uh, the, the way in which um, the new walls, the new walls are set on the earlier walls uh, because the walls are a stronger, uh, more solid foundation uh, than the pill of the house uh, within. So it makes sense to build a wall on top of another wall on top of another wall because that's the most secure foundation. So both the social and the material reasons. There is a lot of retention um, of various types of energy uh, through time. And the protension looking forward is uh, we, we see a lot of evidence that these people using these houses to build ancestry and build power by, by trying to bring in, bring in ancestors into the house, trying to revitalize the house by bringing in bull's heads and bull's horns and so on, and a whole series of elaborate ritual ways. Uh, but the pretension also um, has, has other more material aspects, such as physical physical affordances, such as the need to leave space for new uh, burial. So one of the reasons that you want to build another house on top of an older house is that if you, for example, some houses have 60 people buried beneath the floor. So, um, that gets very, it becomes difficult to add new people. So one solution to that is just to build another house on top and then to, to be able to bury more people in it. So a whole series of factors lead to a sort of drive in a certain direction. And so I want, I, I've mentioned the idea of pots and it just fascinates me this idea that um, we could try to see pots as pulses of energy that, that, that occur in flows and um, uh, in, in a way, this is something that older archaeology was very much uh, caught up in, in, producing these types of battleship curves. And um, in fact, in this, in this room in, in the 1970s, we had uh, big debates with Lewis Binford, uh, and um, he was very critical of what he called aquatic theory or aquatic culture, which was the idea that in, in pre-new archaeology and the cult historical phase, uh, people were just fascinated in the flow of style through time. And he was very critical of that. But in a way, um, with, with, I, I'm trying to go back to that, to try, to try and look again at, at these things, see if we can re-theorize them in a more interesting uh, sort of way, using these ideas of um, flow and pulse and energy and so on. So that it would, you know, it would be possible to sort of look at these types of diagrams and try and understand uh, each individual pot in terms of the retentions and protentions uh, that it that it um, inhabits. So I'm I'm continuing on the same theme, but I want to do a slight uh, shift now. And to move towards talking a little bit more about what I mean by entanglement. Um, 
Well, what we see on the slide here along the top are the different levels of Chatterview from the lowest on the left to the more recent on the right. And then what we're seeing uh, on the uh, vertical axis is various, um, what I might call flows, uh, which, which tend to be things like operational chains or operational changes as they shift through time. So, for example, uh, if we look, can you see that? Yeah. If if um, you take here pottery, uh, and if the, the earliest levels of chapel do not have pottery, but the earliest levels begin to have pottery, which is a, a containers, and then gradually through time, that there are more pots used for cooking. And later on, pots get used for storage and display. Or cooking grain, we know that they were baking bread initially and then um, using uh, cereals as gruel. And cooking meat, they shifted from roasting to boiling. And then, uh, the early levels, uh, they cooked, while pottery was not being used for cooking, they were using clay balls in order to cook, which means they heated up clay balls and put them in containers in order to heat food and so on. So these are all gradual shifts, wood, timber, bricks, a whole series of things that are gradually changing through time. Different flows, flows uh, to do with how to use wood, how to use bricks, how to use ritual, or how to tracks of burial, uh, different types of houses and so on. So these are all different types of flows uh, through this one 1,100 year uh, sequence. And these are so the entanglements. Um, what, what, what I mean by this is that they, these are all ways in which uh, these different flows are connected um, and bump up against each other and, uh, and sort of uh, interfere with each other. So that, um, uh, for, for example, um, the cooking of the use of cooking pottery that emerges in around the middle of the sequence occurs at the same time as the use of sandy material for bricks. And uh, uh, because these houses, these organic bricks were not very efficient, they, they kept the houses kept falling down, so they shifted to more sandy bricks. And the sources of the sand, the sandy clay for the bricks and the, and the pottery were the same. So there's some sort of connection uh, there. They're tangled up with each other. Um, the, the, the cooking uh, in pots allowed uh, a cooking of gruel and the boiling of stews. And so again, different, the processing of cereals and meat were able to change. So the whole series of ways in which all of these things get tangled up in each other these different flows get caught up in each other. And uh, so, so a particular example is that, uh, you know, we started off with clay balls being used for cooking, whereas pots were used as containers. And then uh, around this time in the sequence, there's a shift towards pots used as cooking, uh, which then allows uh, for, um, uh, cook, uh, changes in cooking, more efficient cooking, uh, so that one can more easily process uh, sheep, um, sheep meat, and there's a there's the adoption of milk, so processing uh, milk in these in these pots, uh, boiling gruel, uh, and uh, making meat stews. So a whole series of things here, which are which are associated with increased sheep consumption and herding. So the, the amount of the densities of sheep and sheep goes here and increases quite dramatically. So one could argue that that's partly partly caused by this change of cooking technology. So, so that you have this small event which with another event come together to produce a whole series of changes which lead to larger and more independent houses that houses start changing towards the end of the of the, of the settlement to become much larger and more independent because they're able to be more dependent on domestic production. 
uh, and that leads to a greater emphasis on storage and pottery and so on. So, so the point is that when you have these flows that are all tangled together, and you hit them with something, there's this sort of ripple effect that that um, that that sort of creates a wave, if you like. So you sort of see this little sort of wave of, of, of events that, that that occur, and uh, so it's obviously this type of um, imagery or, or model. <coughs> So another way of expressing expressing this is to talk about a series of flows that, for, the, for various reasons, are brought together at, at, at certain conjunctures, leading to transformation and to the emergence of um, of, of changed forms. So, um, in, in this is a way of trying to say that uh, initially you had people. Cooking, so you have cook, the cooking flow, if you like, and the, and the clay ball flow. And clay balls were used in baskets. So you have the basket flow, uh, and um, uh, as pressure is placed on the house, all, all sorts of pressures are placed on the house, and a more efficient method of cooking is needed. And so clay balls. Are, de are decreasing and there are fewer baskets, fewer clay balls, uh, but you have quicker cooking and, a, and in the end a bigger house and cooking pottery emerges for the, for the first time. And it's not that it comes from nowhere, but it comes from other pots which are used as containers down here, but cooking pottery is, in, as a, is a, an emergent form. So that's a, a, a way of trying to talk about how these flows come together Get caught up in each other, tangled up in each other, uh, leading to transformation and uh, and change. And I want to try to to bring this um, a little bit closer to to home, and to um, talk about a little bit about the modern world and and in which these ideas about entanglement seem to me to be relevant. And he, here is a another type of flow in more recent times, although. It goes back to uh, the of you and, the, and the Neolithic, the very earliest use of the spindle world. And, and you can do the same thing for the, you know, the first wheel or the reduction of tap or whatever you, whatever you like. M many sort of important events that affect us today uh, took, you know, took place in the Neolithic and, and later. But in this particular case, we're talking about uh, very early spinning. Uh, spinning wool and then looking at the spinning of cotton uh, and the emergence of uh, automated uh, water frame uh, um, spinning machines, which then led through time to the, the, the modern ginormous um, uh, spinning uh, systems. And so this is a flow, but it's also entangled in many, many other flows and it's difficult to see how you can how you can really um, uh, describe that. But in any of these sequences, like the wheel or the apple, the entanglements of things that start off being relatively limited. Uh, right at the beginning the, the spinning wheel is related to the wheel uh, and um, clothing and agriculture. But as we go through time into the 18th uh, 18th, 19th, 20th century. Cotton, cotton spinning is uh, very tightly tied up with colonialism. Uh, uh, trade, the British, the British East India Company trade, international uh, um, uh, force migration, slavery, uh, clock, ironwork, ideas of progress, child labor, wage labor. Gandhi imperialism, the telegraph, tenant farming, credit trains, industrial capitalism, uh, share profit, I and mean, so on and so forth. And and uh, and nowadays the use of pesticides, pollutant contamination, and synthetic fibers, and so on. So, so the point is that that these flows um, have have enormous uh, duration, and a, a, a lot of them get caught up in these very complex entanglements. Which, which are so multi-stranded and so um, uh, octopus-like that it becomes very difficult to change to change anything. 
So as one as one sort of very temporary example, one way of reading the, the, what's been happening at COP uh, 27 is that you had you have two flows that have come into contradiction with each other. One is our overall desire to reduce emissions, and the other is global inequalities. And so initially we thought, okay, well, it's just a matter of reducing global emissions. But in COP27, that bumped up against uh, the, the entanglements with global inequality, meaning that one could not move forward in terms of reducing global emissions. In fact, global emissions seem to be rising. So, and so um, that, that's just a modern example of how um, of how these sort of flows get entangled with each other in such a way that it becomes very difficult to resolve them and find and find solutions. So, so finally, just to summarize then, what, what I'm trying to argue is that the, although one, one ends up talking about things, um, that properly there are no things, there are just strings, the strings of things, and, and everything which you think of as a pot or a, as an entity. Is actually just part of a string. And there are no things, no stuff, just processes, flows, and pulses in series. Um, so, and so all these flows and processes move in different directions. Uh, it's not very system like, it's sort of rather like felt, where you just have a lot of these things mash. So it's a mash work, if you like. And these these, inter these different flows as they come together do allow the concentration of energy and potential, what we call objects or, or things. So these flows can be very, very productive. And things, you know, enormous things like the Hadron Collider or whatever involve an enormous amount of energy uh, to put them together. But the intersection of flows can lead to contradictions and change. Some of these flows last millennia, and problems such as climate change then have very deep entangled roots, and are thus very difficult to solve. So I, I know that sounds like a rather sort of negative, um, negative conclusion, uh, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it. But um, I, I do think that archaeology can play an important role. In trying to draw attention to the longevity of these flows and, and the fact that these previous entanglements do have an impact on the world we live in today and are part of the reason why we find it so difficult to get out of messes like, like climate change. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, like currently, we have ceramic cultures, and you'll refer to the one like ceramic culture and the one that comes after it. And we have like boundaries, like date boundaries, etc. Uh, like date rough date boundaries. Yeah, so yeah sorry. The one they began producing it when they stopped, and when it really would emerge. Um, so. For the ones that do show cultural continuity, uh, how would you refer uh, under this like new, or maybe not new philosophy, but the one you're doing here, how do you reinterpret those uh, different cultures? Yeah, I, I do think that you know, modern, modern dating things uh, uh, changes, uh, really change things. And so at Chattahoo, we used to have I showed you at the top the level, you know, level G, H, I, J, K, L, and so on and so forth. And, and that's because we found it very difficult to, um, to date any individual event. So say if someone moves a heart, the only way we can do that is to relate it to a type of pottery or a type of lithics that we think of is common in a particular stratum. So we have this idea that there are these levels of strata. And we group everything together as best we can. Uh, we find ways of putting it together, either stratigraphically or um, by typology. But uh, at Chattahoe, you know, we, we, we've really invested in Bayesian uh, statistics and radiocarbon dating and have a thousand, a thousand dates. 
And this is allowing us to something completely different, which is to say, you know, um, we're, we're now going to talk about what happened in the last quarter of the 67th millennium, or in the 67th century BC. Last quarter, 67th century BC. And, and then what happened in the, the third quarter, the, you know, the next one. And so it's still slices, but the 25 year slices. And, and because you've got a lot of dates, they're all over the site. You can say that in this particular event happened here, and this event happened here. So we don't need the levels anymore. We, we just ditch the levels. And, and we, we group everything by, so we haven't published this yet, and we're still working on it, but it's, a, it's um, very, very expensive in computer time and so on. But, but, but the end result seems to be that we can just forget about levels. So in the same way, forget about culture. And, and just to talk about the really historical terms, you know, this happens here, and this happens, this happens here, and then that happens there, and that happens. We don't need to have these cultures. Yeah. 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 Ask a question. Um, so I hope I'll be a bit embarrassed if we cover this in the presentation. Um, but uh, it just I kind of looking began. Um, I thought of another kind of dilemma, conundrum, philosophical conundrum from the classical world, being a Zeno's paradox in the era. Okay. Um, and for those who haven't heard of it, um, um, so maybe you take like any any few shoot an arrow. Um, and you look at it, any sort of temporalist instant will appear stable. And so if you kind of combine all these things, and of course I'd say people who are shot arrow style correct, um, the arrow never should be able to move. Um, and so that kind of really resonated with me my presentation, but I was kind of wondering, um, so I kind of, I can kind of, I, I, I'm on board with this idea of flow and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm wondering how you just kind of go from A to B. How do these flows converge in the first place? Well, is there some sort of common principle or is all sort of circumstantial that causes um, you know, social inequalities and climate change to converge into one mm -hmm. sort of uh, generative nexus? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, I, I, I tend to talk in terms of contingency. Mm -hmm. So, if, if you if you reject the sort of system type view and just I mean the idea of entanglement is that everything is very messy mm -hmm. and it's a, a mesh work you know it's just lots of stuff or, and it's not there's no reason why the flows should relate to each other at all they're just all wandering around doing their own thing yeah and so well but they all they all have their own to some degree their own independence I mean you know they have their own internally generated mm -hmm. you know like we want to we want to reduce inequality or something. So they have their drive, if you like. Yeah. And, and that leads them north of the, and then they intersect. Right. And, and apparently sort of congest and it just seems like it comes out of nowhere. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. you know, how did Trump appear? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, right. so you think, but 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 then when you think about it, it's quite clear why it's something right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, because you can see how the how these forces were, you know, my generation just didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, and so uh, does that does that help? So I I I very much resist some sort of final. In the end, it's yeah yeah yeah. 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 So, so I, I and I doubt I think it would be very difficult to do that some final explanatory framework mm -hmm. that said you know when some when you get A you will always get yeah B I think yeah. You know. right. Okay. And I'll just check to see if anyone in the Zoom has questions. Can I take a question here? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it may be a bit of a Yeah. Um, but in he actually has a very, uh, a very nice part to illustrate temporally uh, this idea of the flow going um, through time. Are you thinking of this uh, theory of spinning um, and processing the spatial theory as well? Um, uh, can, you, can you imagine that the theory works the same way? I think 
Um, so the separation of space and time is you know, something that I would question and I would want to try and talk about you know space time um, because um, you know at China Hoyu, what, what is a spatial relationship if everything is moving around all the time? And so it, it seems like any spatial relationship is very dependent on time. And so anybody you can say that time varies spatially. Um, you know, people have different notions of time. You know, you know, the, uh, um, look off idea of market time and church time. You know, there are lots of different some notions in different places, time seems different. So I, I'm I'm sort of worried about sort of trying to separate space and time. And uh, but but um yeah. I, I mean it, it's clearly the case that the, that the flows I'm talking about can extend over enormous expanses of space. I'm not sure if, if am I trying to answer your question at all or no, no, no. this is some I, I mean I, I don't I don't see the thing as spatial. I see them as very fundamentally temporal. And 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 the and the, the approach that I'm taking I think is different from say network analysis or even assemblage analysis. I mean there are a lot of different temporary uh, theories about you know, the new materialism or ontologies or whatever, the new theory, the theoretical framework, symmetrical archaeology. A, a lot of it is very influenced by network, network, um, or what Mingdor calls mesh work. Um, and um, so I, I'm I'm very critical of that, of the approach on network. I think that's very difficult it's precisely because it forces to lose time, or at least many of its applications seem, seem to be um, talking about you know, trading or movement between entities um, uh, rather than looking at how the whole thing develops through time. So, so um, I, I, I do see the string as temporal, string, but, but certainly in space time, you know, they're sort of moving around, interacting with each other, and so on. So it's a good question. I, I, I'm struggling to get a good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. The context of flows of the into combining the context of the whole of this time. I also think that the context of flows between also contribute to for example history dimension as a space space the flow of the continuity of space so for example like the case of history between history making and the tax for the development of society no, I agree. I, I, I tried to say that in one of the slides that, that the flows can come together to create things, by which I mean institutions or structures or houses or whatever they are. Flows can come together. But it's almost the so one way of thinking about this is, is that um, there are these flows all the time, and we're desperate, we desperately can't cope with that. You know, even in our language, even in my talk, I started talking again about houses because I need a, I need a category, I need something to hold on to. And so we need structure, we need categories, we need, we need to stop the flow. But it, it's an endless struggle because, because the, the flow keeps escaping us. And, 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 and I use the word house and then I realized that I shouldn't be using the word house. 
and so on. So that I think that's right. That Deleuze and Guattari talk about it in terms of territorialization and deterritorialization. It's just these two two things that are going on all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um. Some. Uh, thank you for that. It was very really enjoyable. There are definitely historical and contemporary examples of people very consciously trying to disentangle themselves or their things from these yeah. larger yeah. paradigms. Yeah. Do you think that there's ever any success in that, or is everything so entangled that you have no chance of ever actually removing yourself from these bigger? Well, what do you think? Um, I I like to hope so, because I think it would be good to imagine that we can disentangle our behavior, for example, or like really exploit to global citizens, for example. But I'm also skeptical because everything, especially in contemporary times, also historically everything as you know, as was part of the point of the whole lecture, everything's so entangled, it's quite it's such an ambitious thing to try and remove something from it. And I was yeah. just wondering what what you think. I mean it's become a sort of trendy Californian thing to, <laughs> to declutter or to um go minimal. And uh well, I live in Istanbul now and there's also a uh, big movement towards um, what's it called, tiny houses, and, and they're really amazing. I mean, really, they're quite expensive. <laughs> you know, they're about a quarter of this room, and uh, and people live in them. And, um, and, and, and yeah, there are, there are lots of these movements, lots of social movements, and individual movements. But as you say, uh, while one can do that if you have money and um, time. To do it. Um, when, when we get to talk about things like climate change, it just becomes very difficult to see that individual action. I mean, I, I it's very depressing, really, that that, that um, you know that the Ukraine war led to people reinvesting in coal. Because you would have thought that you know we made progress here. And, let, let, let's suffer for a little bit and, and stay stay with the plan. But immediately, you know, we don't we go back to sort of using coal. And so it's sort of um and and I and it's for me it's most striking with poverty. So a good example of an entrapment in entanglement is the poverty trap. And and the prop the poverty trap just seems very, very difficult to break. I mean, you, you even if you spend a lot of money. It doesn't be people it's difficult to get people out of poverty. And why is that? And so one of the answers is that because poverty is in, it's entangled with things like health and education and housing. And 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 that because of all the different tentacles that are all tangled together, it becomes extremely difficult. And that, that's why the level of mobility is so pathetically low in America and, and here. So I I am I, so I I end up even like you I I sort of feel like we, we should all try and do our best and so on, but the the scale of the entanglement is such that it's difficult to see, uh, particularly in a world in which there is no central leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes very difficult to see how you would enforce something. And they're depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, what do you think is the end of the women to the object that you mentioned? I mean, do you think it's like intrinsic to the object comes to the category of value and heritage that is what we do in the heritage of it? Or do you think it's like the meaning of it is to be the object? I mean, which is the result of social, political, cultural? Uh, in time, we need to add the social model. I mean, what's the role of the object in the society that's called the medium in the form of the Is it something that we can bear in mind? So, um, I, I guess it's all, all, all of those things. You know, I, I um, really of objects. Things have a, a wide range of, uh, of um, meanings and functions of, of various sorts, and and these these are um, partly functional, mechanical. You know, screwdriver helps with the putting of screws. 
So that, 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 that is an energy. And what I'm talking about it. In the same way that a you know a brooch is a symbol of status, a different type of energy. And that when when you use a new screwdriver or a screwdriver or a new brooch, you're 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 hoping you're expecting that the energy from another another one is, is you know is also true of the one that you've got. You're sort of taking on some of the energy. And in terms of uh, heritage, I haven't thought about that so much, but um, uh, heritage is, is a good example of, of something that has conflicting energy, depending on who you are. In the case of indigenous versus you know, UNESCO, it's a con conflicting energy. Um, but it's undoubtedly the case my view that if you look at those sorts of processes they're about flowing the energy so chapavi is put on the is put on the work on a world heritage list in 2012. so that whole process is very much about church wanting to take energy from other world heritage sites around the world and you know and get it so that it would be a turkey more status globally and attract more more tourists. So, so that's a really good example of how there's a different flow of energy, a very different source that that the, the Turkish state wants to make use of. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Returning to um, my, my initial thought, um, so the impression that I, I got from the response is fairly structuralist sort of thought, not in the sense of social structure, but in the sense of uh, agency versus structure. Um, kind of, you look at you know, geological strata and kind of think, you know, uh, you know how determined my life is, right? Um, but from that perspective, it just can be very hard to remove ourselves from. You know, the, the kind of force that's behind um, you know, long-term developments. And wouldn't that suggest, and I'm not saying I'm advocating for this perspective, but wouldn't that suggest that you could theoretically sort of step back and look at it and think of how it is and, and theorize how these flows are coming together and what causes these flows to come together? Um, yeah, I, I am... <laughs> So, you know, there's a lot of this sort of new materialism, relationality stuff around at the moment in our political theory. And I, I would argue that the entanglement is different mm. in that it is about entrapment and dependency. So it is better able to talk about um, uh, inequality and injustice. Uh, but I wouldn't, I would hope that I was doing that without different structure. So for me, uh, the, thing, the thing that creates uh, inequality and poverty and so on um, is, is the way that the different flows are caught up in each other. Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, it becomes very difficult to, um, to escape it from that. And so, um, in, in the classic sort of master slave relationship, master slave relationship, um, there's, a, there's a, a dependency, but they also have their different, they have their different flows, you know, but they're dependent on each other. And the negative, and that's what I call a dependency, is a negative relationship, but they're tied together. And that creates what you might call structure, mm -hmm. the tying together of. Um, Different facets of society. So I, 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 I probably am, as I you know, earlier in my life, I was very structured. Right? And probably, probably there is some bit left over from that. But I, but I would hope that this is a different argument. That there isn't any, I don't, so there's no structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just that things get tied together through, through these dependencies, and that creates a sort of. Um, 
a little bit difficult to you know, find your way out of them. Yeah. Yeah. That... yeah, no, I, I must have meant the kind of the, the, the free will kind of regard, but it's the same, the same degree, yeah. 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 Do you think these entanglements are always kind of like any oppressive and generate inequality, or is there other forms of entanglement that can actually alleviate inequality? Or like I'm thinking like um, some types of disability, you know, being um, integrated with and having mutual vulnerability with a mutual uh, action with other people can kind of grant more access rather mm -hmm. than limit it. Well, I mean, I, I would probably argue that all entanglements have positives and negatives. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all good and bad. You know, but why do you get into them in the first place? You know, so for me, the sort of tip, the classical example of entanglement is our relationship with um, cereal. Because, you know, we, we really like cereal, small, small plants, and it's really good in many ways. But it has this unintended consequence. That the you know the rapists became tough, and so we, we had to sort of do harder work to to get the cereal out. So you know, but undoubtedly, grain is a very positive. You know, we couldn't well maybe maybe undoubtedly maybe anyway. <laughs> you see the problem. <laughs> so, but you could argue that grain is an important thing that has really been the basis for all the good things, but it's also you know, have a lot of very, very, and really nowadays, you know, the implications are, you know, have been entanglement has been really bad. And so, I, I mean, I think it's always the case that the positives and positives and negatives. And, and, and the problem is that it's often difficult to know. And, and uh, it's very related to short term, long term effects. You know, I've just come back from um, Kenya. Uh, I'm looking at a place that I worked in in, in the 70s. Um, and that place has been destroyed by short term uh, NGO in, in, um, interference, completely destroyed. And, uh, and that's because you know, these NGOs have five year grants. They go in, you know, they, they build up their, their portfolios and they all get PhDs. <laughs> but, but, and then they leave, and then it all, long term, it all fell apart. And um, so, so I think it's, yeah, I think, I think a short term, long term term is very important in relation to that positive negative thing. So, the solar panels is another good example. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or, and then renewable energy. You know, that seems great. But you know, down the line, or, or social media. Social media is a great example. You know, the iPhone and things. Really positive, really positive things about you know iPhones, and but that's also really very negative things. Well. No one has any more questions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. And I guess uh, just keep an eye out for our gem card and the possible coming next year. We'll see you